So let's talk about the vitrectomy itself. Um, the standard vitrectomy is the same as the procedure known generically as FOV. Uh, in, doc, uh, in clinical terms, in medical terms, uh, the vitrectomy is the technical name of the eye operation to remove the vitreous. Uh, over the internet, in layman's terms, this is also known as, as, as I'm sure you know, as FOV, fovio, uh, excuse me, floaters only vitrectomy. Um, I'm not going to go over this too much, but it's the same. There's no difference in, in the procedure. It's the same nomenclature. So what you may be seeing on other sites is that uh, certain people will offer to do a three-port, 25-gauge transpars plane of vitrectomy, or simply a vitrectomy. So let's go over the nomenclature. The three ports are standard. That means I'm going to be making three holes in the eye, one for my left hand, one for my right hand, and over here, I'm looking at the illustration. I hope you can see my... Uh, cursor. Uh, we'll also insert a tube in the third hole or port to keep the eye inflated as we're operating. 25 gauge means, uh, refers to the thickness or the thinness of the instruments being used for the operation. Um, 25 gauge is thinner than the old thicker standard of 20 gauge. Um, in the old, older, or many surgeons still use, but I don't, um, thicker instruments, the 20 gauge systems would be like using a huge McDonald's straw to do the, to drink your soda. Uh, what 25 gauge is doing is basically using instruments as thin as a coffee stirrer to do the same operation. And since the these instruments are so much thinner. In general, they don't require sutures or stitches uh, to close these holes that we create in the entry ports. So 25 gauge ha refers to the thickness or the size of the instruments. Pars plana is the location in the front part of the eye where it's safe to introduce instruments. So transpars plana means through the pars plana. So if we go back to this top line, three port, 25 gauge vitrectomy or trans pars plana is a vitrectomy through the pars plana. And that is the normal routine uh, way of vitrectomies done by a retina specialist. That's how I get something complicated and make it even more difficult to understand. Sorry about that. All right, I am going to, many of you have, uh, may have seen this video. I am going to try and switch my screens to the video. It's just about two and a half minutes so that we can show you, show you the concepts of a, a vitrectomy uh, kind of live. So bear with me as I switch screens. If I were really good, I could probably turn your, the screen sharing off, but I'm not that good. All right. So I think many of you have probably seen this. Um, here's the beginning of the operation, and these instruments are 25 gauge. So we just, I don't have to cut anymore like I did. I basically have your eye. And we, quite frankly, just with pressure, insert these trocars, these sleeves, into your eye. So we've, uh, we've put two of them in, and here's the third trocar. And again, that's the tube. I'm checking to make sure that the water is turned on before I insert it into your eye. And then I want to check that the tip is in the right place, which is what I did just then with the lights off. So now we have the 25 gauge vitrectomy uh, instruments inside the eye. And we're doing the vitrectomy. And within the vitreous are some of the floaters. 
And I think in this video, it's very easy to see the vitreous. It's kind of um, wispy and cotton candy-like. On occasion, I will inject a green dye or I will use Kenalog, and that will help me see vitreous, which is otherwise difficult to see. So I, by the way it mixes in the eye, I can tell where we still have to remove vitreous. And I use the dye or the, uh, the uh, Kenalog, which is basically a powder, uh, just to kind of mix with the vitreous so I can see where there is uh, remaining vitreous that may need to be removed. Uh, this is particularly helpful in young people. At the end of the operation, I need to make sure that the retina is as healthy as can be, specifically looking for tears uh, that may have been caused by the uh, operation. After that, all we have to do is pull out the plugs. We'll put some drops on the eye, we'll get, inject some medicines, and then put the patch on, and then we're all done. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video in just a second and then go back to the rest of the slide presentation. There's that guy with the patch again. That famous guy with the patch on his eye. All right, so just a couple more slides and then I'm done with my part. So I promise you we talk a little bit about PVD or posterior vitreous detachment. Uh, I've got two slides that will hopefully will really uh, be helpful in trying to figure out or define what, the, uh, what exactly is a posterior vitreous detachment. The reason it's um, important for me is that it really lets me remove, most efficiently remove vitreous. Uh, the vitreous when we're born is adherent to the retina all around the retina, both in the front and in the back. And if you looked where it says detached vitreous on the illustration, you can see this separation here in the back. The posterior relates to this surface, this back surface, or this posterior area. A posterior vitreous detachment does not always cause floaters. And I just want to I want you to know that because that's another misconception that I've come across in that everybody feels that a posterior vitreous attachment means that you're going to have bothersome floaters, and that's just not true. In fact, everybody will get a PVD as we age, yet most people do not notice floaters who have a PVD. Uh, Mark Erickson, by the way, is the illustrator uh, where I get all my um, great pictures, and I think he is he is just absolutely outstanding. And he owns this company called Jira Design. And I'm going to thank him again at the end because I think his, <clears throat> the ability in which he makes these illustrations are, number one, anatomically correct. But the amount of detail that he's gone through uh, to really, uh, in, in his illustrations, really make it easy for me to uh, demonstrate whatever I'm trying to discuss or teach. Um, so here we have another slide about a posterior vitreous detachment. And if you look here um, in the illustration, you can see that the vitreous has separated here from the posterior vitreous. So that, whoops. So that kind of lets the vitreous move forward. Here's a retinal tear that can sometimes happen with a PVD. And here's a little bit of a retinal detachment. A PVD can sometimes cause a Weiss ring. A Weiss ring is this circular attachment where the vitreous used to be attached to the optic nerve. And it is only present in some people with a PVD. You don't always see a Weiss ring, but when you see it, it's circular. It's just kind of an interesting factoid, and we call it a Weiss ring. Not everyone gets them. Um, and it doesn't mean you're better, worse, or indifferent. It's just that in your particular case, you've got a circular ring showing the attachment of the vitreous to the optic nerve. <clears throat> At the end of the operation, 
after I think I'm done and I've removed vitreous and maybe I've used Ken Log or ICG dye to stain the vitreous, I want to look around in the peripheral retina. And I made this slide with this gray ring because this was where the this is where it's likely for uh, tears to be found in the so-called peripheral or anterior retina. Um, after I look for tears in the retina, if I see any, I will treat them either by laser or freezing. That's the standard way of uh, treating a retinal tear. Uh, if we are going to put in sutures, I'll put the sutures in to close the uh, sclerotomies. And that, those are the little holes through the white part of the eye. I'm going to inject some antibiotics and some steroids so that you'll immediately have some coverage, even though you'll have a bandage on. Uh, I'll give you some dilating drops so that when I see you the next day, you're, arguing, you're already going to be dilated. Uh, in the younger patients, um, I found that I don't need to do this because our, our, uh, the dilation will last at least two or three days. I'll give you some ointment, and then I'll put a patch on your eye. After the operation, you'll go home that day. It's an outpatient surgical, surgery center. Um, you can kind of chill, relax, eat. I want you to keep the patch on. I don't expect you to have any pain or discomfort. Um, you can certainly call my office if you are concerned. Uh, but that evening, uh, I'm going to give you a call to make sure you're doing as well as we expect. So <clears throat> we do check up on you, um, whether you're at the hotel or in the comforts of your own home. Uh, and then we'll make plans to see you the next morning. On the next morning, or the first post-operative day, we'll take the patch off. I'll check your vision, I'll check your pressure, and examine your retina. And I just want to make sure that your retina is attached, that we didn't cause any problem, and that there's no signs of infection, et cetera, et cetera. We'll, talk, we'll give you instructions on how to use the drops, and we'll talk about any possible restrictions on your activity. Most of the time, there are no restrictions on your activity. Uh, I usually recommend uh, complete full uh, restoration of your activity uh, 24 to 48 hours after the operation in most cases. Um, I don't know why there are some doctors that put gas in the eye for a straight vitrectomy, but I don't do that. And I find that, um, and because I don't do that, I don't need, I, because we don't put gas in, you can go home, whether it's airplane, train, vehicle, what have you, uh, whenever you're comfortable. Your first follow-up appointment with me or your own doctor should be within the first seven to 10 days after the operation. So uh, most of the time we operate on Fridays. So on Fridays we'll operate. You go home that afternoon. I'll give you a call Friday night. Saturday morning we'll take a look at you. Um, and obviously if there's no complications, uh, you're free to go. And that includes flying. So I just wanted to say thank you. It went a little bit longer than I thought. It went uh, almost a half an hour. Um, this, is, this is my email. Uh, many of you have already been in contact with Chrissy, who is my basically my internet liaison. Uh, she's been my been with me for probably four or five years now, but she is your primary contact point if you're if you have questions or if you uh, think you want to come to Virginia for an office visit or for a vitrectomy. She's the one to reach out to with regard to scheduling uh, and making sh and getting a date. Uh, again, I'd like to thank Mark Erickson from Jira Design. He's the one that provides these awesome, awesome images. Okay, um, at this point, oh, these are three of my kids. And I'm, I'm getting a little old. This was about eight years ago. Um, I'm going to stop the presentation and turn it over to questions. And I would ask you to just type your questions. I'll read them and then answer them. Uh, and we'll do that until pretty much everyone's had a chance to ask questions. Let me just, there's that guy again. All right, so first question. Let me the second one. All right, MG. First question, MG asks, 
Of your floater-only vitrectomies, how many patients or what percentage have developed cataracts within a year or two after the procedure? Basically seeking greater detail on the likelihood of cataract formation. I don't actually track because it's it's become impossible for me to track all the patients on whom I operate. And the reason is for that for that is a good percentage of patients come from out of state, and um, I kind of lose follow-up after the fir first uh, follow-up with your own doctor. For patients that remain here in Virginia or in close proximity, I would say the chance of the pe of in reviewing those patients over the last, let's say, three years, I would say fewer than 10% uh, or even 5% have had to have cataract surgery uh, within really three years um, of having the operation. Um, Again, I think there's an overemphasis in the likelihood of cataract formation following vitrectomy. Um, I think the some of the literature that states vitrectomy causes uh, cataracts is considering vitrectomy for all reasons, including, like I said, retinal detachments or macular holes.